still today? Is that its purpose? Public broadcasting in say in Canada. I I think I think that any state sponsored public broadcasting uh, doesn't exist unless the state finds it valuable. Yeah, I think one of the advantages of public media that is autonomous and created by citizens is that it is not beholden to uh, the interests of government. It has other problems. We have another question. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Mira Chakalad. I'm from Mexico. Uh, first of all, I just uh, wanted to point out one uh, news blog from here in Vancouver. It's called now public dot org or dot c i think it's like news is now public so it's i find it very interesting and uh, it's called say it, you say it uh now public dot c a or dot org something like that and it's a news blog like citizens media kind of thing yeah it's now public now public yeah. okay it's from vancouver yeah. and my question is like in, in, is in actually playing like two parts the first is like I was thinking, like, does the public really care about public media right now? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, we, we care and our older generation cares. Like, the, the current generation and the teenagers, those who will be the future consumers of media and everything. It seems they are mo now mostly maybe consumed with, like, uh, music or video games or all this kind of thing. But how, what is the percentage of them that they need? Or maybe blogs also, but not maybe the news blog. Mostly like MySpace or social networking kind of thing. But how much of them are really going, going to consume news and all this kind of public uh, things that are going to influence them in the future? So, uh, my one of my question is, does they care? And uh, one of the second thing that just went to my, I was inter interested is like, in the U.S. Uh, part, uh, in the Congress, I think there is a kind of a pending bill about net neutrality that says that the content producers would pay the would pay the carriers depending on the traffic that they generate. So that would really affect the future landscape that you have been portraying, like is the video blog or video this online TV this kind of thing. So if that bill goes through the U.S. Congress, what would be the future landscape? I mean, that would be totally, I think, change the dynamics of this future new media landscape. So, yeah, actually, I don't know the status of the net neutrality bills, uh, the legislation stuff, since uh, what, what any of that that's uh, looking like since the midterms. But uh, those are two really important big issues you brought up. One, one is demographics and, and today's public broadcasting. And the second one is what's going on in the U.S. with net neutrality. Um, I, I would actually encourage you to look at two sites to get current information on the net neutrality if you're already into that issue. And one is freepress.net. Um, and the other is... Um, Hold on, I'm not going to remember it. It's, it's, it's uh, the Consumers Union site for activists on media policy. Bob, uh, do you happen to remember what it is? Well, save the internet. Well, save the internet.org is, is good for uh, net neutrality, but then, then there's um, Consumers Union actually runs a really good website on media policy issues <laughs> generally. And I think you can probably just Google around and take a look at Right. Hear us now. Thank you. Hear us now. I love. Yes. Ah, really. uh, so uh, I think that's where you can find it out. But just for those of you who are not already listening to about net neutrality, uh, this is a big, messy issue, and I actually don't think uh, uh, my guess is the legislation is not going to go forward because it's uh, there's there's a kind of gridlock among different policy interests. Uh, but the question is, are providers going to treat traffic equally, or do they get to um, uh, do they get to privilege some traffic over others? And um, there's lots of different ways that that uh, providers could favor some uh, businesses and some voices over others by different um, uh, techniques. 
how you uh, legislate it to make sure that that won't happen, I'm not sure because a lot of that stuff is actually going on now and it's largely invisible to people. Uh, you can do some you can do some forms of uh, uh, limiting unfair treatment by providers on the, on the internet but um, that's to, that's going to be a continuing challenge. I don't think that will ever go away um, is, is trying to figure out how we're all getting the same kind of service. The first question you raised is, is interesting. Uh, it's very I'd love to know what the stats are here in the United States, for uh, an entire generation, the story was that people watched public broadcasting when they were very little until they went to a kindergarten. And um, then they basically left public broadcasting until they were in their 30s and then they came back and then they watched it. And what's happened since is that they still watch it until they go to school. And in fact, some of them watch it until they're about 9 or 10, but they don't come back. And the older people are dying. So public broadcasting <laughs> is work about their demographics. All right, and this is where they had this problem with needing to, uh, they depended on membership money. And that membership is all older people. In fact, it's all people over 60 um, to, to stay alive. And those are also the people who are, those are a lot of those people who are, uh, those are the Republicans who are sitting on the local boards of stations who then call and complain to their congressmen and if budgets get cut. Those are really important people to the system. Uh, and they really want their mystery, you know, and, and their Lawrence well, Welk and whatnot. And, um, and then, you know, you, you need to be edgy and interesting to a, a young, younger group of people, but those older people don't want to tune in. You know, they're, they're, all in a, they're all upset about that. The other thing that's really upsetting is that younger people are not uh, really interested in the habits of television that older people are interested in. So they, they're looking at different screens and they're watching in different ways and they, they want a lot more control over what they're watching and they, they also want a lot more input into what they're seeing. They want to be able to help make it. So th this is where the, that mindset is very, very disturbing to a lot of people who are so programming to the older people. A lot of the older people who love our public broadcasting in the U.S. are not interested in being participants. They really are not. They like passive television. They, they want to just get the good stuff and make sure that you know it's not going to be too upsetting. So you know, if public broadcasting in, in the U.S. does not have uh, the luxury of uh, not paying attention to uh, it, its core membership audience because they are absolutely central to the budget. And it's, it makes it, it puts them in a terrible position to innovate and to attract a younger audience. I, I really would like to know what it's like. You have a question. I think there's a question over here and then I'll go back here. Please, go ahead. Hi, my name is Gabriel. Um, and as a young person and communication student, I'm very much interested in YouTube and the, what's going on on YouTube. I've been observing a lot of what's going on in there. And um, I was just wondering if you think that in the future, this, that structure of YouTube where it's genuinely interactive and, it, and essentially it's, all, it's, it's a bilateral communications technology, do you think that in the future, like, what you were saying earlier, um, to answer that gentleman's question, do you think that this will eventually influence the structure of mainstream television? Whereas, like, now it's, like, very top-down and there's no, like, do you, can you, do you care to make any predictions? Ah, oh, no, I would make a dumb <laughs> and under no circumstances would I make a prediction, and neither would anybody else in the business who knows what they're talking about. Our, all of us spend a lot of time reading information, almost all of which is crap, trying to figure out what the heck is going on. No, none of us have any idea, and it could very well be you who comes up with some really cool innovation that will change the business model tomorrow. Google doesn't have any idea how to monetize YouTube, really. They're trying out a bunch of things. They spent what we spent almost two, $2 billion dollars uh, on the bet that, that You'll figure it out. <laughs> that, that people will keep figuring out what they really want to do with this stuff. And that's why I say this is so nascent. This is the very beginning of a, a new way of doing things. Um, one thing I'm not terribly concerned about with this, with this open environment 
is having uh, it devolve into uh, a non-interactive platform. The, the providers of these services are really aware that the reason people are going to them is because they want to participate in them, not because they want the platform to bring something to them. Um, I was at, in a meeting with, with Yahoo, uh, Yahoo people, and it was around rights issues. And um, they're concerned uh, about this question of whether they might become liable for copyright problems uh, for what people upload. So that was the discussion. And that's not what interests me in this, in this discussion. What, what I learned in talking to them was that they felt unable to provide information to their, to their, um, uh, their own public that was using the service that would direct, be directed in, in any way about copyright because they felt the last thing they wanted to do was to establish a relationship with their customers that would be uh, in any way paternalistic or telling them what to do. That, that was, they knew that that was the last thing that people came to Yahoo for and that they, they, they're, you know, they wanted Yahoo to be the customer's friend. So the question was like, how are they going to you know, be liable for all this copyright and still be everybody's friend? So I, I just say that to you to, to say that I think that the, the people who are running these services are, are really concerned to try to figure out how to find a way to monetize them, but not give away the core, what they think is the core feature of them, which is that they're participatory. Our, our, the problem I've been trying to address today is, is what will it be if you care about not only participatory, but public? Question over here, and then we'll come back in the center. Hi, I'm Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I have slight hearing problems, so I really appreciate it. Just keep going. Sure. Um, when you talked about uh, Wikipedia, you mentioned that the people who, who really watch Dogged and who are really involved in monitoring it, they really take on the belief of um, neutrality. And that's kind of what what fuels them and that's that value that they hold. And um, I was wondering for One World Net and Second Life, like I haven't been on them, but is there a similar sort of policy or kind of manifesto about neutrality that, that um, you know, that they use? Or you know, you touched on an issue I think is absolutely fascinating. What are the standards? What's the etiquette? Yeah. What, is the, what are the ethics? And also in a participatory environment? Yes. Right, and Wikipedia doesn't have a uh, video, as far as I know. But the yeah. other one does, so I wonder if that makes a difference um, in terms of, you know, watchdogging and in terms of how people communicate. Um, where one might be yeah. an activist and one is more about neutrality. Just wondering what you thought. I think the, the, it's like a Pandora's box. And that's it's it's so it's kind of exciting. Uh, One World has a completely different approach than Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, and it's it has a certain it was founded with a certain notion of what the what what its value should be. One World has a completely different set of assumptions. Its assumption is that it is a, a, an association of partners who all share common values around human rights. And they do actually have a little mission statement that expresses those values. So they're not telling you everything that happened in the world. They're telling you what their partners think is important given their values. And what they believe is holding their site together in terms of standards is the values expressed by their partners. And the monitoring is done, and it is a monitored and moderated site. It is, uh, it is not a, 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 a completely grassroots participatory process like Wikipedia. It's, uh, it, you enter news in there by becoming a partner. And the partners have to be voted on by national uh, boards of one world in all those 12 countries. Um, and your material then goes to editors that is then, um, that is then posted and then people can comment. And now, in, on the um, on the uh, television site, anyone can upload, but there is a moderator who is looking at the stuff so that you know porn doesn't go up, so that defamatory stuff doesn't go up. 
Uh, so it is, it is a moderated site, and it's moderated around values, and they don't claim to be producing objective material. They claim to be uh, giving you the material that their partners believe is accurate, timely, and important for you to know of. Right, but they are used by news sources. I'm sorry? You said they were used by news sources. They are. In fact, they're one of the top four news sources on Yahoo. Uh, so they're why people do trust them. Uh, and, and their attitudes, we're not, we're not uh, traditional journalists. We're, uh, we're a new kind of news that's generated in, through civil society, through nonprofits sharing those human rights values worldwide. So that's, that's another set of standards. Um, and then you mentioned one other one. Second life. Second life. Second life is good, and you will just have to follow that. Uh, Second life is, is a commercial enterprise. Uh, they, uh, it, it is intended to make money, and it's intended to make money both for the people who are avatars in it and the people running Second Life. Uh, when, you, when you click on Second Life, you can see how much money has been traded that day. It's an astonishing amount of money in, in real dollars. Um, uh, people are generating new virtual products there every day that then go into a virtual marketplace. It's just a breathtaking phenomenon. And it's a whole world that's not involved. They've, they've run into all kinds of new policing problems of the avatar behavior. They're, they're, solving, they're solving sort of all the civil society and, and you know, repressive apparatus and state issues that we haven't realized in, in Second Life. And they're doing it as they go along. So you can kind of watch it in real time, see what, see what their standards of behavior are becoming. I think in every one of these new public media sites, there are, there are different sets of problems. Thank you. But there has to be a lot. Over here, please. Um, sorry, oh, I'm sorry, the mic up front, and then I'll come to you in a minute, okay? Alice, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Alison Beal from the School of Communication. I was very interested in your discussion around the demographics of participants in public media. And it led me to wonder about what else is known about their, those participants, specifically in terms of their social capital, their incomes and education, and also perhaps their geographic distribution. Because one of the things, of course, that uh, Canadian uh, public media were supposed to do, although they never have, uh, in addition to uh, representing, um, uh, if you like, a state-centric model of society, was in fact to provide access to communication to the whole population, despite the problem of geography that's always alluded to here in Canada. So I'm just wondering if anything else is known about those participants in public media that would allow us to, to assess its social reach beyond uh, the demographic issue. Uh, sorry, the age issue specifically. And the second thing I'd like to know is um, to what extent these uh, the public media that you discussed this evening are active around or concerned about uh, the problem of state surveillance of people's use of media. Of people's what? Use of the media, mm -hmm. uh, of them in particular. Right. Uh, the, first, the first question, um, don't let me forget the second one. Um, first question is about what do we know about the people who are forming these publics? And you know, all the evidence I know of is basically you know, one step up from anecdotal. Sur survey monkey type of research, you know, you send it out and you see what you get. Um, the data that public broadcasters work with is, is also bad, but it's, it's so much better than anything we know from the internet. That it's, um, uh, you know, there, there's a greater degree of sobriety to what we can learn. Amer in, in America, the, people are very uh, concerned in public broadcasting to point out that, that it really does reach all sectors of the population and reaches uh, disadvantaged uh, and underserved audiences to a greater degree than, than are representing the population. I'm sure that's not true on the internet. Um, but what are, the, what are the exact dimensions of that? I have no idea. One World is, um, is uh, an example, and Global Voices are two examples of incredibly international um, blogs. Uh, I heard from an African blogger last week 
that Africans spend as much on their internet access as they do on food in any place that there is internet access. That, and they get crummy internet access for it, but they are willing to do to go to incredible lengths for it. And apparently, um, if you take a look at Global Voices, that's certainly true. Africa is a place where the internet is a primary source of information. Um, so some of your one's assumptions about the internet world are sort of, um, you know, there's counterintuitive information out there. Uh, one world has been, for instance, extremely important in rural India. Uh, not always on the internet, often on cell phones. Accessing, it, when even uh, having one person who can access internet information transmit on cell phones. You have critical information such as weather reports to areas that have no other kind of reach. Uh, so, you do, I think there, it would be hard for me to imagine that you don't have a more privileged sector being online, and especially on anything that looks like second life, on anything that involves broadband, on anything that involves video. Um, I, I can't even, uh, I, I have a computer that's now too, too old and too gawked up to even download second life. I have to, to watch it on that piece of computer. Uh, but do I believe that this, I, I, I said that one of the things, one of the issues that I think we're looking at is how we replicate our, our meat space inequalities in, on the internet, just as we have on every other form of communication. Uh, we have greater opportunities to not replicate them, but will we take advantage of those opportunities? That's a choice, I think. Uh, one of the things that appears to be true so far is that um, more people who are disadvantaged and who haven't been heard from are using this medium to communicate with other such people and other people who are not like them and they have ever been able to use any other form of mass communication. So it is, it is a uh, highly valued medium. And it, some studies have been done in the United States on African American uh, populations and um, and school districts that primarily serve African American populations. And you have uh, a great enthusiasm. But you mentioned social capital, and I tend to think of cultural capital. That, that's a whole other issue. Um, how much are you bringing to the party in the way of expectation about what kind of conversation you're going to have? That's another way in which we can easily replicate our, our inequalities in, in our new environments. The other question you asked was the other, oh, the, the surveillance issues. Um, we have certain um, think tanks and organizations that are extremely concerned in very, um, in very effective ways about surveillance. And one of them is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and another is an organization called EPIC, Electronic Privacy Information Center. They have to do absolute killing research and killer um, uh, activism around it. Uh, and it's worth doing. A lot of it is really, really, really arcane. And most people who use the internet have no clue. They just have no idea how open what they're doing and uh, available what they're doing is to anybody who really wants to know. I, I'm actually not so worried about governments. Our government is absolutely pathetic in terms of knowledge of how to use uh, uh, ordinary digital technology. Uh, I am much more worried about uh, sort of electronic games. We're about to ready, I think, to adjourn to the tech gallery very shortly, but there are a few questions remaining, so I'd like to come to the front and then come back to you. Okay, please. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, kind of the super media seems to be fully adopted by corporate companies. I think it's quickly, quickly. Yeah. Yeah, Seizing upon it and in so much, so much more public yeah. broadcasters. Yes. Yeah, and I'm kind of. Not, not the broadcasters, yeah. but the advertisers. Yeah, but it's even like NBC is starting to, and there's CBS's, and they're kind of they're, they're, they're starting to co opt it, which I think is a really not a good thing. We don't want them to do that. Um, so, I guess my question do you think that um, public media or, or uh, autonomous public media? can create a kind of viable alternative. Because so far, they're not. Like, it, most of the distributory media is either commercial or it's 
being bought there or will be let down public is commercial and MySpace is owned by Fox and YouTube, Google, Yahoo. Do you think that there can be like a public service viable alternative that's actually popular and not kind of in the way? Dude, those are great questions. And uh, I have to say, um, I don't, I'm not worried about corporations um, buying valuable, useful services and growing them. And there are people I know who really are, you know, think that Google is the new evil. And um, it may be. I have, you know, but, but right now, you know, um, Google is, is um, investing in providing services that I think are incredibly valuable. Uh, and they're a big corporation, and they're, uh, I'm really happy to have their search engine. So, um, to, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that they're taking stuff that's being invented by people as public, um, public services and then stealing them away or co-opting co them. I think YouTube was started by entrepreneurs who wanted to sell it, invested in by VCs, uh, and who made a lot of money when Google bought it, and they're all businesses. Uh, on the way, they provided platforms, but by using those incentives, they provided platforms for people to be able to create publics, and they have. The question that I'm looking at is, what's, uh, what happens next? And that's why I have that slide in there that says, is it time to collapse? Like, does, does it just all happen by magic? Uh, I, think that, I think there are enormous opportunities here, but I don't think that, that uh, all of those public behaviors will just grow on their own. I mean, I think that stupid pet tricks behaviors grow quicker. Um, if you take a look at all the examples I showed you, um, One World and Witness um, and Denshaw and the experiments of public broadcasters, those are all backed by private foundations and um, by state subsidy. Um, Wikipedia is an interesting example that's not backed by, um, uh, it's actually not, it's, it's not a, it, that is a nonprofit that has its own little foundation um, that was started with some money from somebody who got rich in a dot com. But it's, uh, it is not, uh, it's, a bunch of the Silicon people love it and, and have helped to keep it alive with its three employees. Um, but if you take a look at all that, I think that's kind of a, a statement that, that there's a bunch of projects out here that, that are going to continue to need some kind of uh, support and goodwill, that it's not, that, that um, Google is not going to make that its top priority. Google actually gave, it gives grants to nonprofits, and it gave a grant to One World for a while to uh, it, we have One World be sponsored links on Google. So you will continue to have that kind of charity goodwill on the part of very large, filthy rich corporations. But um, no, I think it's kind of up to us to build public spaces, and I think some of it can be built on on volunteer work and goodwill, and and some of it is going to need some. Um, the social tissue to keep it alive. And I'm, I just, I just don't know. That's where I look at the assets that public broadcasters bring, and I think they're kind of a natural, they're kind of a natural resource here. If they could, if they could pick up the leadership, uh, the time in one of it would be great. Thank you. And we have time, I think, for what I see is the provisional last question from this very patient and very passionate spokesperson. Um, my name is Maura Massasaka, I'm a student from SFU, and I just wanted to touch again on, I guess, the youth issue in, in that I'm interested in how media literacy kind of uh, works with participatory media and plays a role in, in developing these values, and I'm just wondering if you know of any sort of on-the-ground media education programs that have been effective in targeting media or youth, not only in just um, media literacy, but production of new media, and if any of these sites are, are youth-targeted. Uh, there's a site called listenup.org that is an aggregator site for youth media, and the people who run it are wonderful resources if you're interested in finding out where the cutting edge is in, in youth media. There's a project that I actually think is so cute, um, and it's called scenariosusa.org. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's a, a project where they go into high schools um, often high schools where kids do not are not permitted 
another great state policy in the U.S. where there are states in which children are not permitted to learn on, on sexual education. Uh, and it's only permitted to learn about abstinence. Those are usually the states that have really high STD rates. Um, and when you go into these high schools, they offer uh, uh, kids a packet of information that they cannot, they won't take to school, but they can take home and discuss with their parents about some reproductive health issues uh, or HIV. Um, and the, in school, they write screenplays about them. And the screenplays, uh, they select a screenplay uh, that they think is the best. And then um, Sierra's USA personnel contract with a Hollywood producer to come and direct and make a film about it with the community, with the parents and the children uh, who wrote the scenario, who wrote the screenplay. And then those little movies are then um, shown in a variety of formats, including being um, screened online, uh, streamed online at scenariosusa.org, and can become part of um, uh, teacher education materials elsewhere. But I do think that media literacy is, it has a really, really bright future because you can now do media literacy around teaching people to make stuff for uh, a participatory environment instead of teaching them about how crappy popular media is. Uh, and actually, we're in the center, my Center for Social Media is in a project with uh, MIT to produce media literacy materials for uh, people doing participatory media. We're in the very first stages of that, too. There's also an open source uh, base site called participatoryculture.org. Oh yeah, so really good. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. And Democracy Player. The Showcase Democracy Player. Wonderful. Okay, um, there's still more people, but maybe we can talk in the reception. Last, I think there's one last, did someone just shoot up with a question? Yeah, my name's yeah. Greg Dean. I worked on indie media at, at 3rd Street in Seattle. I'm working in co-op movement now. I'm, I'm wondering if perhaps we don't have to find collective structures of ownership to be able to maintain public space, or if, it, or if we're not, if we're not by having those, by not giving ourselves those structures, if we're not dooming ourselves to this, the the marketplace duality of buyer versus seller, oppositional kind of structures of the public versus the private, where the private always winning, essentially, you know, or subjugating. To, for the public to negotiate some kind of place. You know, they, um, once again, not to cut my thing, but public broadcasters bring this huge asset of uh, the trust brand, um, CBC, PBS, NPR, and um, they could argue that they need their resources to develop platforms that are protected platforms that do provide opportunities for people. So. Um, I don't know whether indie media provides uh, instructive examples in the, in the um, successes and failures of, of providing uh, providing such platforms as well. But it's uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's an important feature that, that there be some stable place for people to go. Yeah. Thank you. These are wonderful questions. I'm going to suggest that the dialogue may continue. You are invited to join us for a very informal and modest reception in the Tech Gallery. Patricia very kindly agreed to stay around for a little while longer. On behalf of the Scry Foundation and SFU, we'd like to thank you very much for the drop tonight. And it's all Uh, with media literacy, and I know some of you are interested in a range of other things, so please do look, up, look it up and join us uh, next door. Thank you.